My question is, John, have I got my best side? Have you got your best side? I don't have a best side. Um, <laughs> you, you you look good from one angle, but you kind of pixelate from another. Yeah, uh, I, I may. I shouldn't move too much. Maybe that's what needs to happen here. Yeah. So look, I'm just going to chat for a few seconds, John, whilst the uh, the Facebook Live gets a few folk jumping on to come and play, which is brilliant. Uh, hopefully, the technology is going to work tonight. We've had a few bits of fun with the tech. Have you tried any of these live streams at all? Um, I've done it straight to Facebook, and that works yeah. okay. I've never integrated Zoom and Facebook. So I was going to ask for your advice. Um, I won't now. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, I don't know how the, the two talk together. Uh, uh, I don't either, John. You know, the, you know how this works. If you want to get any answers about technology from yeah. me, you have to go through someone who knows the answer. I mean, I can pretend to know the answer. Uh, mm -hmm. I will muddle my way through it and then I'll, I'll secretly text Jack and go, Jack, can you make me look intelligent with yeah. technology? Uh, you know what we should do? <laughs> we, we should not be at live and we should get Jack, Henry and Corin, get them to do a talk. And they probably know, That's exactly what they probably know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> they know exactly what's going on, John. So look, we've got a bunch of people that joined us. Uh, oh, good man. evening to everybody watching the live stream. Uh, so I just want to say hello to uh, the mighty Teresa Allen, who is the queen of copywriting from her previous life. Uh, Teresa has been responsible for about three hours of Jack's time today, whilst he's been going through some of the, the spelling and grammar issues that may or may not have been on our step-by-step -step guide. Uh, and Joseph says, hi, good evening, Joseph. Uh, Liam and Amy from the team are here. Fantastic, Kerry's here. And uh, amazingly, John Kamati from uh, Vintuk Namibia has joined us as well, John. So not only do we have people from wow, Kent and from Wales watching, we're, we're chatting to John uh, in Namibia as well. It's the obvious place to, to have viewers from, John. Do you I have any other Namibia. fans in Namibia? And to Kent. There we go. Yeah. And to Kent, great. yes. Linda's joined us from Kent as well, so this is great. So look, everybody, the topic this evening is a fascinating one. How do you get your business in the media? Because we all know that there are gains to be had by having your, your company uh, you know, featured in newspapers, on the TV, on the radio, in blogs and online magazines. But how do you actually go about it and what's the process? And my guest this evening, I would like to welcome the mighty John Card, Good evening, John. Great to see you. Now, we know John really well. We've been working with John, uh, I think it's, it's, it's about a year now, John, isn't it? Coming up to about a year. Yeah, yeah. about a year. So, uh, so James from the Pop-Up Business School team, who some of you have met, um, our Joseph's in Walsall, and uh, uh, Oliver After Dark. Hello, Trevor. Great to see you. We've been chatting on LinkedIn. Kim from Bolton is here. Someone uh, from Russell Walsall from is that right? Yeah, Warsaw as in, in the Midlands, not oh, Warsaw no, as in Poland. But not I, yet. We do have a few friends in Poland. You know, I, I, you know. I, live, I used to live in Warsaw. That's where I grew up. So, yes. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, okay. I think you might be okay, getting Okay, so uh, uh, give us one of your favourite haunts from Warsaw, Joseph, bef uh, for Joseph, before we start. Can you? How long ago was that, John? Oh, I was going back a few years. You know, if it's, if it's a Joseph, there's a good chance that I know which one you're talking about. Not that there oh, aren't right. many Josephs, but I've got a fair idea that it could be one of my friends. Oh, uh, okay. You probably know the Lazy Hill Pub. If you know the Lazy Hill Pub, it's the one that I'm thinking of. Uh, but everybody knows the Lazy Hill Pub, John. Even I know the Lazy Hill Pub, and I've not been to Walsall, so there we go. So, look, we're, we're dealing with this issue tonight of how to make your company famous. And uh, the reason we're calling it that is that's the title of John's book. And what happened, we sent, uh, we sent, oh, we've got the book here. Here we go. Um, shameless book plug already. We've not, even, we've not even said anything yet and he's got his book out. Brilliant. Uh, you can tell this guy is in PR. Now, <laughs> we're going to learn from John tonight. And the reason that we got involved with John and his wife, Corinne, they run a business called Full Story Media and they're based down in Brighton. Uh, James from the Pop-Up Business School team went on one of John's media training courses and at that point, we'd probably spoken to about five different agencies over the course of a couple of years, um, including a couple of freelancers as, as well as, as slightly bigger PR agencies and so on. And, you know, we sort of hit a few dead ends. And James came back from meeting you, John, and he said, yeah, I think 
I think it would be worth us having a conversation and exploring this further. I've learned a whole bunch from this course. It's really, really practical in classic Jimbo style. He'd already started applying some of the stuff that he learned. Um, and, uh, you know, we started a conversation with, with John and Corin. Now, since we've been working with John, um, the reason, this is the main reason why I, I really wanted to get you on this live stream and share some of your knowledge with, um, with all of our, our friends from the Pop-Up Business School crew and the other folk that are joining in and watching our, our content um, is that you've got some amazing results. And, and that's what talks, isn't it? You get the results, John. That's why. And I, and I, think, I think a little bit of what you do is a bit of a dark art. And I want to explode some of the myths tonight. So if you're somebody that's running a business right now, or you're about to start a business, or you've been in business and you're trying to, to pivot and you know take advantage of the situation at the moment to reinvent your business and so on, John can give us some tips on how to do it. And just to give you a quick flavor before we dive in, um, I, I would love, oh yes, yeah, so there's a few book plugs. Kerry said, yes, you should definitely Google John. Uh, fullstorymedia.co.uk. I know Jack will put in the uh, in in the comments um, to give you a flavour. The sort of things that have happened since we've been working with John and Corin. Uh, you may have seen uh, a clip of me on BBC World News, which happened just before Christmas. Uh, John and I had a fun morning out uh, at an early start up at the BBC in London back in the day when we were allowed to move around on trains and things. Remember those time, those heady times of about oh. seven months ago. Um, and, uh, you know, BBC World News that's beamed in over 20 countries, 60 million viewers plus, and so on. That was as a result of the work that John and Corin uh, do. We were in the Telegraph, uh, featured in the Telegraph as one of the COVID-19 business heroes of, uh, of a couple of weeks ago. And a whole bunch of other publications online and in mainstream media that have happened as a result of their work. So what I would like you to do is if you've got any questions about how you can get your business in the media, please stick them in the comments and I'll do my best to put John on the spot and ask him very difficult things without any notice whatsoever. And I've got about a list of about 25 difficult questions that I know you're going to love too, John, that uh, let, let's dive into it. So um, I guess it's important to know just share with everybody a little bit of your experience, John, and, and, and what prompted you to set up your own PR business and, and help small businesses? What, what was the journey you've been on? Well, well, the truth is I never, ever wanted to run a PR company because I, I didn't really like the way that they were run. I didn't really have a great deal of an admiration for a lot of them. You see, I was a journalist um, since, since more or less the turn of the century. I've worked as a journalist and um, since the, the credit crunch helped me into self-employment, I've been a freelance journalist. And what happened was basically one day I was sat at home and, and Karen came in and she said, um, Andy, her boss, wanted him to get some press because she'd been a journalist and she was the content person there. And she said, well, you know, what do you suggest? And I already had a kind of a, a mental list of all the things I didn't like about PR companies and all the things I thought as a journalist would work better and and we put them together and you know I didn't exactly know how successful it was going to be because I've never really put it to the test um but Karen just went out went back to work and executed these things and lo and behold it all worked I mean really well um her boss Andy was in the Financial Times BBC you know all over the place so much so that the, the, her, their clients were saying wow how are you getting this press you know who's your PR agency <laughs> and you know, they didn't have one they had Corin and me sort of in the background and so and so it was working nicely and um and so then she ended up doing like press and publicity for their clients too as part of the package because it was, it was you know, an agency it was a digital agency mostly marketing um and and so it was really so that was really exciting but then we were like well you know what do we want to do with this because I didn't want to set up a PR agency I didn't fancy that model at all and, and so to us, we didn't do that much for quite some time. We, this just carried on. And then one time I was actually on a, a trade mission. I was working on this as a journalist and I was with about 20 entrepreneurs. And these were, you know, real, really clever people. I mean, you know, these people had like PhDs. They, you know, there was a reinventing science of all kinds. They were renewable energy entrepreneurs. They were 
profoundly bright people. And we're doing this Q&A and I was helping them to tell stories because that's something I learned. That people who are very good at science and technology aren't much good at telling stories. And that's really, really key. And they were, so I was helping them and they were like, oh, that's great, that's great. And they're writing stuff down. John is frozen. Is he frozen? No, it's me. <laughs> Has John frozen? And then, Have I frozen? Oh, this is exciting. Then I was seeing them going out and pitching stuff out. And I found this day. And the event's called How to Make Your Company Famous. We're back. Are you still there, John? You froze, we lost you, you've come back. This is exciting. Oh, oh dear, okay. So we got to the, we got to the bit about, uh, you had some very clever entrepreneurs, unlike working with me, of course, you had some very clever entrepreneurs that you were helping them tell stories. And then, yeah. and then you kind of froze a little bit and we've got you back, I think. Okay, so you, yeah, yeah, you froze to me as well. So I was just looking at a blur. So yeah, <laughs> so I was working with these entrepreneurs, helping them, um, pitch and they're asking me questions and you know I thought well come on let's 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 do something here so we set up the company and we launched um this event called how to make your company famous we just hired a room and tried to sell tickets on eventbrite and we did I mean and we did that for about a year you know just selling tickets um it was, it was incredibly hard work because getting people to pay and come to an event is tough but when we did loads and we met some really good people we didn't really make a lot of money we, we always broke even or made a little bit um and and then you know we'd been running a business for about a year and we were looking to be honest we were getting a bit worried because we'd run out of money the business had no money we had no money we had to re we were looking to you know remortgage the house soon and i was terrified about sending out my bank statements to the bank because we had, you know, it was just, everything was red. And um, yeah. thankfully, uh, one of the people who'd been on one of my courses, this great guy called Casper Craven, he said to me, basically he invited me to cross to his house where he was running a workshop about business. And I'd help him, I got him on CNN. So he kind of felt like he owed me. And, um, and he, he took me over there and just, Basically, he told me a bunch of things about business, which I just hadn't really thought of. Like, you know, the point of making a sale is to create a customer. And once you create a customer, you can sell them other things. And so I realized that I'd been going around, getting all these entrepreneurs to come to my events. And then they'd, they'd just been disappearing, you know. I had nothing else to sell them at all. Yeah, but I still nice. didn't want to sell a PR package. So we created the Chief Storytellers Program, which was really was meant to be about training and helping entrepreneurs to understand the power of storytelling and as we've been developing it over the last year or two with you and with, with some other people you know we've become quite dictatorial about what needs to be done and what isn't shouldn't be done you know we don't sort of let clients say we want you to do this we want you to do that that's not how we work because that's yeah, i've noticed that it's more the other way around isn't it <laughs> it's more the other way around yeah we sort of say look don't ever do that don't ever do this these are the things you must do and, and we have a model of, of everybody watching. Uh, so Yusuf has said that Casper's a great person and a sailor. Uh, he's obviously got some fans here. And um, I wanted to share with everybody that, uh, that before we went to the BBC interview, John gave me a long list of things that I had to make sure I did. For example, shave, which hasn't happened this evening, John. I'm rebelling a little bit yeah. against you this evening. I had to make sure that I scrubbed up a little bit well. And, uh, you know, no bits of toothpaste on the face and uh, relatively well groomed. Otherwise, it was going to be captured on video and shared uh, several million times, which I, I think on reflection, I don't mind you being dictatorial on that. That's pretty good advice. So imagine this. <laughs> imagine this. You're a small business and you've never got yourself in the media. You're a new business. OK. What, what are the sort of thought processes that we go through? I think we'll dive into storytelling and how to structure that story in a moment. But yeah. what's the sort of thought processes that you need to go through if you think, right, now I, now I really want to get my, my business in the papers. Just to give you some context, uh, Florence, I know Florence is um, from, came to our Paddington event, uh, which is, you came to that event actually, John. Yeah. Uh, Florence has a cat cafe business that as soon as this lockdown is over, I know that she's going to open the doors to that. She's saying getting press and newspapers 
um, in London and women's magazines for the Cat Cafe would be something of interest to her. Linda is uh, upcycling furniture and making forgotten bits of furniture look stunning. She's had some really, really good press, actually, Linda. But yeah. I think she's she would say, you know, I'd love to get my furniture in Vogue magazine or other interior design fashion magazines. Just to give you a couple of ideas for context of, you know, how do you get your business in the media? What's the process people need to go through? Sure. Well, let's start off with a, a wonderful idea. Um, you absolutely can get your business into the press. You don't need a PR agency and you don't need a huge amount of budget. Um, and you absolutely have the skills or the ability to develop the skills to be a media player. What well, the number one thing, I mean, we, we, we sort of have five major principles. I'll give you them all in one go and then we'll sort of run through them a little bit. I'm going to write these down, John. These are the things which, these are the principles which I believe are going to stand the test of time. Um, and, and because they're, they're standing up now, even in lockdown. Um, and, and a lot of what, we did when we put together full story media was you know, to sort of think about what's what are sort of the, the big truths what are they going to be the constants okay so, so number one is be a storyteller right because journalists are storytellers and what we're looking for are stories that's what we have to do you know you if you're talking about getting press or publicity you're thinking about a media campaign the word story should be coming up again and again that's in the middle of your page and everything else goes around it. You have journalists and storytellers. So what's the story? Number two, think visually and create amazing images. So you gave me two examples there. I mean, I, I mean, a cat cafe, upcycling. I mean, I can already picture in my head <clears throat> the sorts of great pictures that could go into the press. You know, the, the these these are, could be uh, striking and so many businesses in the pop of business school you know they're creating physical products and that's great because that that gives you real props to create great pictures now we always for our people our clients suggest a professional photo shoot but if you're tired or you're, you're on a budget you know just think illustratively what you know what does your business really look like to your customers if you're a bread maker come on you've got loads of bread if you've got a cat cafe you should be a business owner in the center surrounded by some lovely feline cats staring over your shoulders, you know, upcycling, you know, some, you must have some exciting and interesting furniture, which you're doing. So think visually. Number three is create your own content. Media in the UK and all across the world is, is, is in decline and it's been massively disrupted by digital. There just aren't as many journalists around. They don't have the time to do that much stuff. Um, and so, you know, you need to write your own story. You need to create your own bios. You need to come up with your own uh, quotes and press. You know, here's, here's one thing which I want you to think about next time you ever read a newspaper. A lot of the quotes in there have never been spoken out loud. Not really. They've been sent via email. Who sent them? Well, the person that they're from or, you know, the, the PR or the marketing person that's working with them. So, you know, create your own content, create your own quotes, your own stories, etc. Number four, help journalists, help journalists to write their stories. And not just journalists, also people that are doing events or we're putting together, you know, promotional material where you might be included, you know, help them to do it by sending over a nice, you know, pre-prepared bio about yourself, your own pictures, your own stories, you know, help to do the heavy lifting for them. You know, whenever I get interviewed at all, uh, whenever uh, I'm, you know, going in someone's book or doing a podcast, I've got stuff that I will send to them about me, detailing, you know, in, in short, sh um, short sentences, who I am, what my experience is. I've got high resolution pictures to send over because they're going to need these things. And mm. finally, the number one, the number one, really, it's be available, be responsive. People often complain, oh, why is so-and-so always on the press? Why is so-and-so always been interviewed? I'll tell you why. It's because they're always available. <laughs> I've, I've seen that with entrepreneurs. I've seen it with politicians. I've seen it with all sorts of people. The people who are on the press the most are the people who just damn well show up again and again and again, no matter what publication is there. And they get into the mix and they get onto journalists, um, 
you know, uh, first call persons. Someone like, say, you know, Tim Martin from Weatherspoons. He found a real sweet spot he did because most of the big pub chains in the UK are big listed companies. And his is a, sort of about the biggest private owned company. And so, you know, we talk about pubs a lot. Pubs and beer is kind of one of those big subjects that we talk about. So who do they call when they want to talk about the latest issue regarding beer or pubs or tax on beer or whatever it might be? They start talking to Tim Martin and soon, and he was always, always, always available. And so soon every journalist knew that they could contact him. And if they did, he'd be there. Because, you know, if you're a TV producer, the one thing you can't stand is an empty chair. If you're a radio presenter, the one thing you can't stand is dead air. You know, you need someone there. Broadcast is actually often, there's a lot of opportunities for broadcast. Same for, you know, and, and for, the, you know, for the print journalists, you know, they've got copy to write today, not tomorrow. You know, today, in fact, probably by the end of the hour, they've got to get a story out there. So somebody who's good to go, someone who's blah, 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 stop talking away, like Tim Martin or lots of other entrepreneurs who get lots of press, they're available, they're responsive, they say yes straight away. Mm. And that's kind of what sort of the number one thing. So those are my, I love those, this. Those so are my five before, big ones. I, I love that. We're, let's dive into some of those in a second. I think I think I just want to get granular for a second. Who is it we need to who is it we need to email? Do you put a press release, you know, your, your story that you've written up, do you stick that as an attachment or do you copy and paste it into the body of an email? Um, you know, and do you add the photo to it too? Do you follow it up with a phone call? You know, what's what's the sort of mechanics? If you're thinking of these, you know, all of our small businesses that are watching that want to get some press either in, you know, newspapers, magazines, or, you know, trade press, trade magazines, trade blogs that are specific to their industry, for example, what 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 are your sort of tips on you know how to how to email who to email and 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 how to structure it sure in terms of um if if you've if you've put together a press release or or as i like to say a story because press releases are often you know they read like they come from the marketing department i prefer stories you've read my press releases john haven't you we we, we don't it needs to be the story that i'm sharing not the press release yeah (laughs) We, we don't really send out press releases, not in the traditional sense. Hope this hasn't so even, even using that language is more likely to get the thing opened, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, when we put together a, a story which we sent out, you know, the, the style in which we write it is in the style of a newspaper, believe it or not, because we're sending it to a journalist who's writing in that style. Yeah, it's yeah. it seems uh, it's revolutionary. I mean, you know, we just like write it in a a good standard news format. We put a headline. We have a kind of a couple, a little, couple of teaser sentences. We have a couple of strong lines to say what the story is and some plenty of quotes. Um, by the way, you always paste these things into the body of the email. Don't send attachments, right? Because you want the journalist to be able to read it as quickly as possible. And if they've got to open up an attachment, that's an extra action for them to perform. So yeah, you paste it into the body of the email. We often, we typically do send pictures. Um, we would send the lower res, lower res version of the picture. Um, so they, they know what the picture can look like. And if, they, and if they want the higher res or they need it, then we tell them that on the email that, you know, that the higher res are available. So if they, they need to go into print. Because the low res probably okay for online, but if you're going in print, you need high resolution pictures, which you can blow up big. And same for the magazines. Okay, nice. So yeah, so, so we, we'd attach a picture, but yeah. then we'd paste the story into the body of the email. And 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 you would you send this to the editor, uh, or would you be looking for sub editors on the specific, you know, area of business that you're in? How, what does what does that mechanism look like? I guess it depends on the on the publication or the media channel that you're contacting. But if you've got a sort of rule of thumb, because there's people watching here that are in the education sector, travel sector, um, you know, people that are doing uh, art, uh, we've got photographers, there's someone asking questions about, um, you know, about doing tours. Uh, we're gonna dive into some of the mistakes and the things to avoid uh, for Kate Zwilinska. Um, and a couple of people are asking about, I don't have a story. How do I get a story? And when's the right time to tell it? But just before we get into that, who is the best person to contact? And what tips have you got about getting the damn thing open? Because Ali's point is, 
you know, do it's very difficult to get a cold email opened, isn't it? I mean, what's what's the sort of open open tips that you can that you can share that in your experience? I mean, we, I would usually you put the, uh, the headline into the subject line. Um, you might. The other thing which stops a lot of press releases from getting published is a lack of a good photo. So sometimes we put in, you know, photo story into the subject line. If you've got a, if you think the image is strong, you want to flag that one up. So we put that up right near the top, maybe photo story, and then an interesting headline. The headline is one of the most important things. I mean, it, in many ways, it is a journalist's job to create one, but you know, we often want to make sure that that's clear. And so the headlines, the headlines are really important because if if it's just sort of says, you know, press release, companies' sales increased, you know, it's it's boring. And so you try and not to me, John. It's not boring to me. I understand it's boring to everybody else. <laughs> well, indeed. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of the point. Well, yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize that what makes them very happy and excited <laughs> is just not very interesting to the, the press. Um, there's there's different ways to write headlines. I mean, my my favorite is when you have two things which don't fit together. You know, the unlikely pairings. So it's kind of like uh, so. One, someone that we work with, Carleen Jackson. Um, she's a dyslexic on, entrepreneur. And, she, and so the, the, the big quote, which has opened up a lot of doors is dyslexia. Uh, I consider dyslexia to be a gift that's helped me in business. So dyslexia is a gift. Now dyslexia, if you say that to most people, they'll say disability. So they don't think dyslexia and gift. So that's two things which don't really fit together very well. That's uh, so like, similarly, you know, we've had, uh, quite a lot of traction with, with pop-up and what journalists really like is they like some real truth some candid truth because there's a lot of PR bullshit out there and here's Simon Payne saying <laughs> two weeks ago my business lost 150 grand and now I'm helping 5,000 entrepreneurs well that's you know that's kind of firstly it's like whoa They've been hit real hard and they're being open about it because, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to be open about their failings or their downfalls. Yeah. And then it's kind of like you've lost all this money, but you're trying to help people in a big, big way. So kind of look if you're uh, whatever your business is, look for the things which are a bit unusual. Look for the things that don't fit together, for the things that surprise people. These are the, the, the stories that, you know, the journalists are looking for. You know, tell me about, you know, you've got a lady that's doing recycling. You know, maybe they, you know, they, they sold a, a chest of drawers for a, a ridiculous amount of money, um, uh, which they bought for 50p initially, or, they, you know, they found it in a skip. You know, I sold this item for five grand and I found it in a skip the week before. You know, that's, that'll catch some someone's attention probably. Yeah, I hope Linda caught that bit because that's a great piece of advice. And I have to say, uh, we, I mean, I, I do poke fun at you for the word juxtaposition, John, because I know it's your favourite kind of headline creation of, of putting two things together that don't belong. I guess that the Cat Cafe is kind of writing its own line right there, isn't it? And there's there's something there for sure. Um, I, when the uh, the Telegraph came and did that piece, they sent a photographer to my house, as you know, which was quite soon after the lockdown had happened. So my doorbell rang and then we had this really weird moment where he backed off about four meters down my pathway. And we sort of did this virtual sort of, we want to shake each other's hand and we sort of waved at each other. And then he kind of came in the kitchen, but he almost had to hover his way into the kitchen because he felt really awkward about being in my house during lockdown. And all my yeah. family was staring at me going, you said we're not allowed anyone in, but it, but <laughs> there's someone in our house. What do we do? And it was all a bit weird. But I have to say the, um, the, that, that approach of headline writing has had a huge impact on our business in the last two or three weeks alone, just by getting that thing published in the Telegraph as part of, it was very humbling to be on a page of COVID-19 heroes. I sort of felt a bit awkward reading that, going, oh, we're here. But that's enabled us to engage so many more people. And actually, you know, we're into, we're into a, you know, a lot of figures in terms of the traffic to our survival guide. I know Jack, Jack will put the link to our business survival guide in the Facebook comments at the bottom. We'll pin it at the bottom because this is the thing where we're putting all of our content. So if this is the first time you've watched any of our live streams, 
you can go back to all the blog posts and videos that we've stuck in there. And we're interviewing lots of different experts. Um, we've, uh, you know, we, we spoke to Barney, the escape artist on Tuesday about money. And of course, we've got John this evening talking about how to make your company famous. So we've got a little bit granular. We've talked about, uh, you know, I think a great tip of putting the words photo story, if you've got a striking picture in the subject line, you know, writing a headline and thinking of the story where two bits don't fit together, the, the most surprising bit about your business, the most exciting bit about your business, the most unusual bit about your business, that's, that's really rich hunting ground. And I think one thing I've discovered from lots of people that have been to pop up business school is um, their stories are phenomenal because we tend to meet people. Most, most of our participants from our, our, our events are, are sort of over the age of 30, which means there's a bunch of history there. And, you know, we've had a, a teacher that set up a cat shop in Manchester um, you know, a pet shop for buying, buying stuff specifically for cats. And her experience was teaching, teaching English to rowdy teenagers in one of the roughest estates in Manchester. And, you know, it's those kind of stories where I used to be doing this and now I'm doing this. I bet yeah. there's a bunch of people watching here that without realizing it, actually, they've got a story right there. I used to live in this country. Now I'm starting my own business in London. Or I used to be you know, uh, a police officer, and now I'm I'm running a business, which is a familiar one to me. So um, I'm all right now, though. Uh, I'm over it. So let's have a look here at, um, thank you, Kate, for your congratulations. I just want to dive in. Let's dive into, um, is there anything more on the storytelling side, John, that, you know, you're, you're out of your five principles of engaging the media. Your first one is about storytelling. And I, I've just sort of given a couple of bits away that are in my head from the work that you and I have done together. Is there anything else that you could add to that that would be helpful for people to hear? Um, well, how about I, I, everyone is a storyteller. I, I believe that. And I believe everyone is very capable of, of being a good storyteller. Um, it's just that we sort of get out of practice I and mean, we learn how to tell stories and listen to stories when we're at school. And then it becomes, it sounds like it's, it's something which is quite childish. And in fact, it's like an absolutely critical business skill. Um, most people, I think, if they allow themselves, if they, if they relax, they can, be, they can be very interesting and entertaining storytellers. Um, how about, should I, should I tell you, give them the simplest story format in the world, pretty much? It's like a three-part yeah, story. Let's do that, because I think specifically, uh, Tanya has, is talking about her business about offering accent softening and English pronunciation as an online offer. Okay. Um, Tanya, you should definitely check out um, Blackboard English on Instagram, one of the pop-ups businesses that, uh, that started. We've got some other people that are asking questions about, I don't even feel like I've got a story. I'm not quite sure where to begin. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do the three, the, the All right, three look. bits. Let's do that. Everybody's got a story, okay? And so th let me let me tell you, this is a question that I'm asked all the time. People say, say how, how did you become a journalist? OK, so I'm going to answer that question and then teach you so you can answer the question that, you know, however you got into where you are today. So how did I become a journalist? So um, about the turn of the century, I left university and to be honest with you, I, I was directionless. I didn't have a career path. I didn't really know where I was going with my life. And I was going around from job to job. I was doing the odd sales job. I was doing an admin job. Wasn't very happy. Wasn't really enjoying it. Thankfully, one of the jobs I took was at a magazine. And um, I was friendly with the editorial staff. And we were chatting. And they said to me, you know, why don't you write like a, an article for us? Because they, I was kind of interested in it. And um, I knew quite a bit about politics. And they said, well, write us a political column about the Iraq war that was on at the time. So this is about 2002. And so I wrote this piece, sort of jokey, sort of punky piece and sent it off to them and they published it. And I saw my words in print for the first time, all designed. I saw my very first byline, there was John Card. And I just thought, wow, you know, if I could get paid for doing something like this. My life would just be so much better. And so I sort of really just set off on a, on a, a journey. And then I was like, right, I've got to become a writer and a journalist. That would make me happy. That would be, and um, I went and got some work experience. I took sort of whatever writing gigs I could get. Didn't matter if I was being paid, but if I could get some money, that'd be great. 
called up a newspaper and sort of said, you know, can I work for you or can you give me some work experience? And they sort of said, well, you need to get this qualification called NCTJ and, and yeah, you probably want to get some work experience. I've got some work experience, enrolled in a college course, stopped being independent when I lived with mom and dad for a few months while I did the course, did the course. And then right at the end, basically threw all my belongings into my Ford Fiesta, drove down to London to take my first full-time job. And, you know, it's not as if everything has gone swimmingly since then, but life has been so much better. You know, uh, every day, you know, I've enjoyed or you know, I never sort of dread the morning as I used to when I was much younger. And that's how. And so, so how can you take that story format and apply it to your life? Right. There's three parts, right? There is a trigger, the transformation, and then the moral of the story. Those are the three parts. So where did your, where does your story begin? You start off sort of, you know, in the ordinary world, maybe life isn't that great. Maybe you're struggling a little bit, but something inspires you. It triggers you to go off in a new direction. Right. So that's the trigger. So for me, it was, wow, I saw my words in print and I just thought, yeah, this is it for me. And then the next stage is the transformation. So, you know, you tried to get your business going, you had some knockbacks, you had some help along the way, whatever you did to get your business going, that's the transformation. And then there's the moral of the story. Now, where are you today? Where's your business today? What are you doing and learned? And who are you? You know, what have you found out about yourself? You know, what, where you are today? So it's, it's, that's, that's as simple a story as you can get. Tell me where you were before your business started. Tell me what inspired you to set up your company how you transformed yourself and your life, and then where you are today, one, two, three. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you who are listening who've got a business can craft some kind of story like that. And, you know, try saying it out loud, try scribbling it down, get some voice activation software if you don't like writing, just talk into the computer and see your words. So, so my story began in 2015, I was, you know, stuck in a boring office job I didn't really enjoy it very much and I was thinking to myself I'd like to do something better and I've had this real passion for cats and I thought well what can I do that would be interesting about cats and I thought well wouldn't it be great to set up a cafe for cats or whatever what have inspired that story and then you know that that and then tell us about how you did it and then where you are today that should be great yeah and I guess the icing and, on and the you cake know, you can absolutely get press for yourself I was going to say the icing on the cake is the uh, is the high resolution photo, the impactful image that tells yeah. that sort of brings yeah. the color to the story, right? Now I get it. Yeah, I mean, now I get it. Pictures are really important. Pictures are so important. So Kate from Bridge End is writing now, and she's definitely got some awesome stories, actually. Kate, I don't know if the live stream lets you, but you should definitely put a picture of the craft kits that you've created and I saw a picture today. They're absolutely brilliant. There are so many, Kate has got some brilliant stories. And actually this is, this is a great one actually. Kate, I hope you don't mind. I'm gonna spill the beans, but only a couple of them. You know, during the period that we're going through at the moment, whilst trying to run, run a business and run a home with young kids at the same time, and I love Kate did a couple of videos where she had to, she went out for her exercise, but I think it was mainly to get some sanity headspace and work on her business she made a video and it was quite fun because she's kind of in the woods whispering going hopefully my kids can't see me I'm making a video about my business you know there are so many incredible stories right now of people that are working on their business ideas whilst on lockdown that in itself is a great story isn't it and yeah. I think you know we should those you know the lockdown thing plus I'm working on my cat cafe business and Jenny Jones I think it's Jenny Jones um has just Can I give you a headline, Simon? Say again. Yeah. I think it sounded like it was like a headline story that you know I set up my business hiding in the woods from my kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right, Kate. If you heard that bit, there you go. Let's. That should be. That should be on. Tell its me about way a few to, I'll generate yeah. some headlines here and now. Let's do it now. Okay, you'll love this one. This is great. On. Uh, Jenny Jones. So Jenny's an accountant, but she also runs laughter sessions to make people feel good and manage stress. So we've got an accountant that makes people cry with laughter. Yes. Like, I love this. Like, 
I thought it was, <laughs> are you, you're doing it now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, no, you're going to do it better than me. I'm going to shut up for the next one. Yeah. Um, so Kerry Barton has written her own headline as a result of your advice. She's talked about herself as the dyslexic photographer in lockdown, uh, which I love. Uh, where are we? There was a couple more back here. Okay, so we've got um, uh, Alexandra Louise is a newly qualified green badge tour guide in Salford, Manchester. And of course, the tourist industry, especially at home, is going to take a big bashing from uh, before it recovers. How can she promote herself and get more social media coverage? And her business is called Bricks and Water Alexa Tours. So she's a tour guide in Salford yes. in lockdown. Yes. That's a tough, that's, that's a tough gig. Yeah. Um, I'm, <laughs> I think it sounds like a great story. <laughs> Sorry, not laughing at you. I'm just thinking it sounds like a, the sort of thing which uh, would uh, appeal to a journalist. Yeah. Hi, I'm a tour guide for Salford, in Manchester, and I'm in lockdown. Yeah. It's, um, I, I'm trying to imagine what, yeah, the, the, I, could, I kind of think there'd be some uh, good uh, quotes that have come out of that piece. Um, that sounds kind of like quite a fun story. Yeah, and I think like from a from a, an entrepreneurial perspective, I, I'm sort of going, you can absolutely run a tour business online, and you know, the, whatever whatever um, Alexandra, I think the name was, sorry Alexandra, whatever you were doing before you decided to be, you know to become the badge holder and do those tours. Um, you know, let's say, for example, you're a teacher. So meet the teachers come tour guide who's, you know, she's doing virtual tours of Manchester from her kitchen. And there's probably a headline in that somewhere that, that John will be better at uh, coming up with than me. Um, I think he might have frozen on the screen. So I'm going to keep talking for a second. John, if you haven't frozen, then say something. Um, so I think uh, Tanya, Tanya said that uh, her story, she said, John, my story is quite sad. I don't know if people will want to hear it. And it's quite personal and nothing to do with my business. So, you know, this is the lady that was doing the, um, the language speech therapy for people to soften their accents and sound more English. Um, you know, I guess if you're going to share your story, it needs to be something that you're comfortable to put out there, right? Yeah. You, I mean, you know, if you're going to go public, you're going public. Um, but, you know, a, a, a personal story, which, especially if it's a story about someone overcoming adversity, that can actually be a very compelling story. You know, all the, all the best stories, you know, really great stories, they're always about struggle. And so if you've, you've been through dark times, you've had to overcome a lot of things to get to where you are today, if you've struggled, then, then actually that that is a very that can be a compelling story. You know, journalists like stories about struggle. Everyone likes stories about struggle. Think about all the best films, you know, they're always about sort of the underdog. They're always about someone struggling through. Um, and I mean, I, one of the things I do in the media training sessions, I haven't really got time for today, we, we talk about the hero's journey story. Yeah. And, and that's obviously a big part of the, the book as well. And it's all about struggle. So, you know, it could be a good story. So we've got... Um... A, a, an opportunity we've got something like 15 minutes left so if you've got any questions for John uh, John I'll buy you a bit of thinking time whilst whilst I talk about this next little bit so my thinking time is that uh, um, uh, Kate has said uh, she's a trauma and abuse survivor who became a life coach to help people heal from traumas and is now doing free anxiety and panic attack prevention program for police and NHS staff I mean that sounds absolutely phenomenal Maybe there's yeah. a head. Maybe there's a headline in there that we can come up with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Russell has mistaken identity uh, for electrical testing, and now he actually does electrical testing. I think there's something genius behind that story somewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, Linda, we know your story, Linda, absolutely, and that that is an, uh, an incredible story of you know when we met you and the circumstances that you're in to what you've achieved. Um, so Sarah, uh, Sarah's watching from uh, Indianapolis, uh, where we ran an event uh, in October. I met Sarah and um, Sarah's, uh, since her original business idea didn't go the way that she wanted because of the lockdown stuff, uh, she's been drawing since that she was a toddler. And finally, during the time that we're in now, she's found herself drawing every single day. And she's so happy because with the exception of a few jobs along the way, it's 70 years later. 
70 years later and she's now doing something that oh she my. loves. Wow. I mean, there's, that's a headline. There's a headline in there somewhere. Yeah. Isn't there? Yeah. It took me 70 years to start my first business. It's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, what sets entrepreneurs apart from the rest of the rest of the population is that they actually finally take the plunge and set up their own company. Um, and so, you know, I came up with my business idea 50 years ago <laughs> and I've just launched it yeah. today. Um, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad that she's got there. It probably would be a good story. Yeah. She should write that one down. Yeah. I mean, I love that. And actually Sarah's for someone that's not been doing a lot of drawing for 70 odd years, uh, she's very, very talented at drawing. And she sent me one of her sketches. Wow. Uh, in the air this morning actually um i guess there's so going to be a lot of people who you know there's going to be a lot of people who sort of say going to be saying you know it, it took a global pandemic to motivate me to start my business um and uh <laughs> yeah. i mean yeah well, it, it took the it, it was the credit crunch that got me so so made me self-employed now i was working yeah. for a magazine i was doing best writing of my life and then you know uh the magazine was just smashed by the financial crash and you know i was made redundant and i've been self-employed for the past decade the language that you use was the credit crunch helped me to start my business and i really love that language i noticed that that you said that right at the start <laughs> and i think uh, i mean that's a that's a headline that's the headline right there isn't it yeah i, I I just, I just talk, I just speak in headlines or, you know, it's just, it's a bit. your poor kids, <laughs> they must, they must walk around the house in a very alert state because they're being fired headlines at them. But it's like, yeah. It's like the newsroom at our house. It's just, yeah. you know, full of cynical yeah. people. <laughs> Dad loses mind over empty cereal box. I mean, your, your kids yeah. must be on tender hooks uh, the whole time. I love that. Right. So, so look, John, I think um, I'm going to ask, there's a couple more questions that are coming in. So last opportunity, folk, if you've got any questions, we've got, we've got an opportunity of, a, of a, an experienced journalist um, yeah. between him and his wife, Corinne. They've got 40 odd years experience of journalism. He's written for The Guardian, The Times. He's got pop-up business school on the BBC and in The Telegraph and all sorts of places. If you've got any other questions for John, please fire them in before we finish. Um, yeah. John, did I interrupt you? There's something I want to tell everyone because people are always asking me about, you know, contacting journalists and how do I get in touch with journalists and so on. And I always say the best time to get in touch with a journalist is when they're actually writing a story where you might be a relevant part. And the thing is, with what journalists are doing these days is they, they advertise what they're writing about. because They want to get interviewees in quick. So they sort of crowdsource interviewees. So I've written down, I hope you can see that, a little... Hashtag there. Can you yeah, read hashtag that? Hashtag journal request. Yeah, we can see that. Journal request. If you go onto Twitter, just open a new tab on Twitter right now and type that in. That will come up with basically a load of tweets from journalists who are writing stories. They basically say, Hi, I'm writing for The Guardian, blah, 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 uh, or whatever. And I'm looking for this type of person. Hashtag journal request. And that's, that's, uh, you yeah, know, you can get national journalists on there, local journalists, trade journalists, everybody using journal request. Now, how you reply to a journal request is really important. And we have got a free, completely free PDF uh, article about this, where basically we'll give you some straightforward advice on how to reply to journal requests and to other forms of journalist requests, because there's other things called response source and harrow and things like that and you know this is what we do on behalf of pop-up and other people but you can go on there anyone can go on there you don't have to be a pr person and you can reply to the journalist who's done one of those tweets as these journal request tweets how you reply will make a big big difference so if jack you've got something which you can put on the the uh the comment section right now uh, it's just a little link which take you through to the full story media website you can download that your guide to journalist requests. Um, you also asked about, and I probably should have mentioned it then, about how to contact journalists, like if you're emailing them or you want to invite them to your event or something like that. Well, once again, we've created a bunch of templates for you. So there should be five templates, which again is on the Full Story Media website. It's completely free. 
ping on there, check your email address in, and you'll get a, uh, a template sent over to you. So check and stick that one in there too. Then that would be wicked. And then, so everyone should get some, along with this talk, uh, two completely free bits of uh, advice which will help you contact journalists. One for the journalist request and the other one uh, email templates and um, other messaging templates for you because you can do this by yourself. It, you, that is, I know a lot of people do and they do so very successfully. Brilliant. I love that, John. Yeah, Jack's put the link in right now, which is super. Yeah. And I think there's a mis there's one mistake which people make with these journal request tweets. So there was a question earlier on, you know, what are the mistakes that people make? But specifically on the journal request, can you tell everybody what not to do with those? Yeah, when you see a, a journal request on Twitter, this is on Twitter, and journal says, hey, I'm looking for interviewees, journal request. I mean, I don't tend to press the retweet button because all you're doing is just telling everybody else about it. So yes, you just you, don't tell anybody it's there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't press the like button. And I don't normally <laughs> comment, to be honest with you, because that there's just no point. Um, it's better if you can contact the journalist directly via email. Sometimes you can do a comment. Um, also, if you're doing it on Twitter and you're looking at the journal requests, please click on the latest button because otherwise you're seeing journal requests which are just popular from probably 24 hours ago, by which point it's too late. So you can be on a bit of a hiding for nothing for journal requests unless you know what you're doing. Um, but then there's, there's actually how to respond. And generally find that email address. Often it's in their bio. Sometimes you can just Google it and find it. Um, and then that, and then reply in a way which is going to help them to be able to write their story. And typically that means sending over a little bio about yourself, sending over some commentary. If you've got a nice low range picture, you can maybe stick that on too and give them the, the components that they need to put their story together. That's great advice. Thank you. John, are there any other mistakes that you've seen people make? You know, when you, when you were back on the desk uh, and, you know, things were coming into you where people wanted to, to get their stuff in the publications that you were writing for, was there any, were there anything that sort of, you know, made you have a sharp intake of breath and hit the delete button before any other action was taken? Oh, I mean, there's so many. Um, yeah, there's so, so many. I mean, journalists' inboxes are just filled with, you know, atrocities really uh crimes against media um <laughs> i mean it, it's what's i mean the the main thing is i have like a little folder called pr fail and they're not the worst press releases um but they're often times where you think you that could have been so much better and so often they just haven't really thought through that it's a story so th there was one which i saw uh a little while ago and it was all about this company which had had a big big growth in sales so you know happy ceo sends out a press release because look at all my sales and i kind of figured that there might be actually be a story in there but i could tell that it was like nowhere near the top and as i went down i turned out that this company was all about they were, they were basically selling their charging points for electric cars and so what this story was about for the people out there was the growth in electric cars yeah that's what you, know, you what's happening in your street is what you care about. You don't give a monkeys that this business is, you know, got 45% growth in the last quarter. You know, that's not a story at all. What is interesting is the next car you buy might be an electric car or your neighbor might very soon have a Tesla and count how do they charge it up? Yeah, that's what it means to the people. So you've got to sort of think about, you know, what, why does anyone care about this story? You know, what's the story here? What is, what does Maureen in Grimsby care about this story you know because they don't care about your business growth but they might care about how it impacts on their life and that's what the story is you know, what it means to the people out there that's that's the interesting thing yeah i and love so, that we haven't run an event in grimsby but if we do run an event in grimsby i want to make sure that maureen comes to it john she's that's a very that's, important that's person we, we need to get her there yeah. to help us with our pr and i think that there's a couple of comments in here about um which i really want to talk to because because i've had personal experience of this of uh, so let me read out um helen lawson's comment it's a great comment and she said um i'm expanding my business from just workplace well-being training 
to a workplace well-being consultancy as well. Should I wait to be ready and more established and experienced in these areas before trying to get that traction? You know, so I think she, I think her question is around timing. And then there's a follow up question to, to that, which is along the lines of, you know, it feels a bit self indulgent, doesn't it? To sort of talk about myself in the media. Maybe I should be talking about my clients or maybe I should be talking about something else. It feels a little bit um, icky to some people to have their face plastered in the media. So it's partly about, there's a question here, partly about timing and partly about, you know, is this really something that I should be doing? Have you got a view on that? I mean, I've got a view from an entrepreneur's perspective and, and you can answer it as an entrepreneur, but also as a journalist. What goes through your mind when you hear that? Well, I think we, we set up our company and um, and the first thing we did was we got a photo shoot and then we wrote a press release and sent it to the local press. Of course <laughs> so, you did. So, <laughs> I mean, wait, wait, did of... it get did it get in the Argus, the yeah. Brighton Argus? Did it get Brighton in? Argus? Of course yeah. it got in. Of course it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's kind of that's that's my take you know I just i'm really interested through. to know like because i you know suddenly you're on the other side of this yeah not only in the term not only are you sort of uh gamekeeper turned poacher you you're also uh you know as an entrepreneur so when i'm no longer the the name in print and the sort of the the faceless guy that creates churns out these stories you're now the guy in the limelight D did you have a moment of um if yeah i'm a little bit nervous about putting myself out there now or yeah. or you sort of actually know i i'm so well versed in in the industry uh, that i know it's the game what went through your I, head I, I had to i mean actually i had to start going out there and doing my own interviews and you know because i hadn't really been interviewed many times i've done a few but not that many so um what i would say to anyone actually who's trying to get their first bit of press is you know get yourself interviewed as quickly as you can and start learning to tell your story, start learning to talk about yourself. Um, you know, it's lots of sort of radio phone-ins and things like that, where you can have a chat with a DJ. That's a good starting point. You know, I've did, I've, you get yourself on their list as well. Um, certainly contact your local press. Um, local press is a, a good place to start because um, the, the journalists there can write some good stories for you. Um, there's a chapter today um, I think you know him actually, uh, Nick, his name is, he's created that computer game, uh, some COVID yeah. uh, busting computer game. And he wrote a story about himself. He said he'd, he'd been on our blogs and he picked up some advice and stuff like that. He worked out how to write a story and he sent it over to me. And, you know, it wasn't like a sort of a professional job, but he just done it himself. And he sent it off to his local paper and they'd taken it and they'd turn into a story you know he'd given them enough information and detail in there plus he'd sent a picture of himself just holding his mobile phone because he's got this computer game and so it's just a picture of him holding his mobile phone with his computer game on and the story is about um basically him creating this new computer game he's donating all the money to the nhs so a newspaper will publish a story like that because you know they're not it's not so promotional and now the there's a journalist there who've taken this thing which he sent over and they've written it down and well, they've basically just written a press release. You know, that, he, yeah. that, that local news story now, it's out there so other journalists can see it. So it gets yeah, sort of spreading around. Yeah, brilliant. And, and also they've, they've sort of like just written his story for him. Brilliant. And so, you know, I just say, you know, get out there. And also think about this, you know, what if Sky News was like knocking on your door tomorrow? Do you really want that to be your first interview? You know, or do you really want the Today <laughs> programme to be your first interview? No, no, you don't. No. no. Start off with the trade journals, local journalist, local BBC, you know, Radio WM or whatever, who, you know, 40 listeners at sort of a certain time of night. Get right. on there, get interviewed, get talking, get used to it. You'll, you'll get better with practice. I love that. And I think, you know, you've just reminded me of, um, I think what's behind some of these questions about timing and should I really be talking about myself I think what's behind that is fear and I certainly went through that and uh, I don't want to drop names but but actually I'm going to drop names when we went up to the BBC 
there's a cafe Nero right outside the the BBC yeah. prestigious head office. I went in there and I met you, John, for a, a cuppa. And just before you arrived, I was sat in there and opposite me was Hugh Grant. And, and I was fine up until that moment. And I thought, oh, no, there's famous people here. Oh, no, I'm going on the telly. And do you remember when we went into the green room just before we went on to, to BBC World News, I got an absolute grilling from the BBC journalist who was... Yeah. He, she just cuts. She just tore me up for paper. And this was not on, on the camera. This was in the she was just sort of asked. She fired four or five questions at me to get a flavor of it. She she sort of played with me for a bit then spat me out and then walked off. I thought, oh, no, I'm going to get destroyed. And I think luckily I had an, enough of these sort of, you know, radio interviews over the years and press interviews and the coaching from you and Corin that, that I think it just about saved my bacon. If it wasn't for that, I'd have been in big trouble. So I think. The thing behind all of this is it, it certainly, you know, when I read that thing in the in the Telegraph that you got done and some of the other bits that we've had in Forbes, I read the article and I do a, a short, sharp intake of breath. I sort of go, oh, no, everyone can see that. Yes, they can. That's the point, because if you don't shout about your business, nobody else is yeah. going to. And it does take a moment of going, you know what, I'm doing something of value here. And I'm helping people. And like Helen's business, it's all about well-being. And she is going to help people make potentially life-changing uh, decisions and experiences because she's helping them deal with difficult stuff. And if, if that's not a business that needs to be shouted about, I don't know what is, uh, Helen. So and I think, you know, what I had to do with, with media and traditionally I used to sort of step back a little bit and let Alan do most of it because Alan, Alan's really good at churning out a soundbite, that's for sure. And he's very confident with this stuff. So I was quite happy to do that because now we're in different times. And, you know, I had to put on my big boy pants and go, right, I think we just need to get on with it now. Let's just go for it and see what happens. And, you know, I haven't got it right every time. I've had a couple of moments where I thought, oh, I shouldn't have said that. But, you know, nobody died. The business wasn't destroyed. And ultimately, it's it's helped us. And it's helped us massively. So, um, and I think one, one final thought, and I'm going to give you a, a chance of a final tip, John. Um, <laughs> but hey, I thought I thought Katie Coombe said that be behaving myself was important, but it's my eyes going and it's believing in yourself is important. That's yeah. what we need to do. Is just, we just need to back ourselves because if you're not excited and if you're not backing yourself, no one else is going to. So I'm going to give a final thought in a second, John. You've probably you've probably got one last tip that you could share with everybody. You've been very generous. What's in my mind is this. Uh, on Tuesday uh, next week at 9 p.m., we've got uh, Ken. Uh, Ken is joining us from his blog, which is called Humble Penny. Um, Ken's got about 15,000 followers on his YouTube channel, and he's been running a blog and running digital online businesses for some time. He's got lots of experience to share about money, about getting financially independent, and about running a digital online business. So if you're around next Tuesday, please please come and join us for that. Ken is absolutely excellent. And uh, you're going to enjoy that one. Um, in the meantime, uh, it's time to tell your story and get it out there. John, have you got one last tip to share with everybody before, uh, before we wrap? I think the final tip is just help the journalist to write their story and think about their job and help them to write a story, especially now that we're all locked down. Yeah, there a lot of the journalists are stuck you know, in their flats or their houses, and they don't know what's going on out there. And you can give them insight from your world as to what's really going on. So, you know, have some guts and uh, get yourself out there um, and believe that you can do it. You know, the, the, the radio shows, the TV shows, the newspapers, they've got to have somebody in it. And so why not you? Beautiful. John, thank you so much for joining us and giving up your evening. Please thank Corin for uh, lending you to us uh, for uh, an hour and a bit. Um, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for watching and for asking the questions. Uh, we'll go back through the thread and we'll pick out some questions if we think there's some more value that we can add, of course. Thank you very much, everybody. See you on Tuesday of next week. Goodbye. God bless. And all that thank stuff. you. All the best now. <laughs>